Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Dane Christensen, the Digital Marketing Manager at Grid Game Systems. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for this very informative webinar, From Big Data to Fast Data. We have two speakers today. Jason Stamper is an analyst with 451 Research with 20 years' experience in the IT sector. Jason meets regularly with the most influential people in the industry, including CEOs of hundreds of technology companies like IBM, Oracle, HP, SAP, and many more. Nikita Ivanov is the co-founder and CTO of Grid Game Systems, as well as a member of the Podling Project Management Committee for the Apache Ignite Incubating Project. In short, we have two of the foremost authorities on the subject of big data with us today. But before we get into the presentations, I have just a few quick uh, administrative points to make. Uh, Jason and Nikita will be speaking for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Now, you'll notice that just above the presentation screen is a questions button. Click there to ask questions at any point during the presentation and we'll respond to your questions during the Q&A segment at the end. So we may not have time to get to all of your questions during this event, but we'll definitely answer all of them afterwards. So please take advantage of this opportunity to ask questions from these uh, leading experts in the field. You can also uh, use these questions to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. Also, I wanted to make sure you're aware that we have included a, a, an impact report produced by 451 Research about grid gain and its technology, as well as a, a PDF of today's presentation in the attachments area. And uh, just one more item. Uh, you'll notice that there's a rating button right there next to the attachments button. So please do provide any feedback you can for us, and that will help us to improve uh, future presentations. So with that, we're ready to turn the floor over to Jason Stamper. Jason? Thank you very much, Dane, for the introduction. So, um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, In Memory Computing from Big Data to Fast Data. Thank you very much for joining the session. I, hope, I do sincerely hope you get something out of it. So, a very quick word on 451 Research. Um, we're one of the uh, industry's best-kept secrets when it comes to analyst firms, but um, we're actually now about the fourth largest, having made a number of acquisitions over the previous years. We bought Yankee Group and we bought Uptime Institute. So uh, Yankee gave us mobile coverage. Uptime Institute is the organization that rates data centers and uh, says how well they're doing in terms of efficiency and power and so on. Um, we've got over 100 analysts uh, in the organization today. And um, I won't read all of these bullet points out, but um, we interview regularly through another acquisition we made called the InfoPro, over 10,000 senior IT people every year to get a real handle on you know, what's going on in the industry. So we're less about sort of counting boxes and um, counting numbers and how many servers have been sold in a quarter, and we're more about what is the sentiment about some of these technologies um, and what's really going on in the real world on the ground. Um, anyway, obviously you can find us at 451.com. So let's get going then. Um, what is, you know, what are we here to talk about really? Why is anybody interested in a webinar with grid gain and what I have to say about this? Well, the problem is there's a big challenge in enterprises today in that um, end users aren't getting uh, the rapid response and the access to the information that they need as and when they need it. Um, and the reason for that is because the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure that we've put in over the years, um, I think Sun Microsystems CEO called it a jalopy. You know, it's become a bit of a animal. Um, it's a bit chaotic. Um, we've done it, you know, in, in piecemeal fashion, um, and that has meant that things aren't able to scale and grow as we need them to, and they're just not flexible enough. Um, and of course, end users see that they can get results from Google in a fraction of a millisecond and they can't understand why they can't get information from their IT department uh, you know, in the same amount of time. It takes days or weeks to find out new information, get new applications delivered, 
um, have access to uh, new sets of data and data marks that they want to analyze. So um, we've called this at 451, you know, the perfect storm in terms of that bottleneck. If any of you have seen um, Faulty Towers, the British um, comedy program, you'll be familiar with this picture. But um, the reason I put this up is, you know, the magazine I used to work on, we did an interview of 200 UK CIOs, and we asked them, you know, what sort of level of gap do you think there is between what the business expects and what IT is able to deliver? And, you know, we weren't surprised that there was a gap, but we were somewhat surprised that 98% of those uh, British CIOs uh, said the gap was significant. Um, and that's CIOs admitting to themselves and to the business that actually we're not delivering what the business needs right now. Um, we're not delivering the information in the format that they require on the device that they'd like to see it um, in a usable fashion with the tools that they'd like to use um, and it's just not accessible and it's not there for them. Um, and equally, the applications that we're delivering to the business take too long to come through. Um, CIOs and IT directors are waiting for the business to tell us what they want um, because they're often seen as a cost center. Um, they're unable to break through that cycle of um, just being a cost center and having to uh, you know, deliver, uh, deliver basically yesterday's promises tomorrow kind of thing. Um, seems to be a lot of the struggle that the CIOs that I talk to a lot of events tell me about. So what does the business want? And this will be familiar to most of you, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, of course, they want speed. Um, the, uh, you know, various analyst firms have talked about big data in terms of three Vs, um, you know, velocity, variety, um, and volume. Um, people since then have added more. You can add veracity, you know, how accurate is the data. Um, you could add value, um, you know, how important is your data that affects where you store it and how you deal with it and so on. So, you know, we can add as many Vs as we want, but speed is definitely an issue. Businesses today, uh, more and more of them are seeing themselves as as much digital businesses as anything else. Um, and so, of course, there's this question of how you get information into the hands of business people, but not just uh, kind of static data that we analyze, that we used to do with something like a Cognos or a business object, that we analyze, that we sort of look in the rear view mirror, but data that is fed into the applications in front of people in their day-to-day -day jobs, embedded analytics, or some have called it operational analytics, which gives you access to information as and when you need it rather than looking in the rearview mirror. So we're seeing a lot more of that as well. So the picture on the top left, I think, is a... I'm not much of a petrol head, but I believe that's a Bugatti Veyron. Um, so speed is obviously incredibly important. Um, and I've already talked about some of these, but mobility, you know, we need this stuff on the move. Ease of use, self-service. I don't want to have to ask the IT department six weeks in advance when I need to do some sort of new type of analytics application. And the bottom right picture is of a heads-up display. I think we'll start to see these on our cars. Unfortunately, I probably think, uh, I think it's probably going to be a distraction. But, you know, this is, the, it, this is what people want. They want information as and when they're driving rather than looking in a rear view mirror. So what causes IT to become a bottleneck? And again, I uh, won't spend too much time on this because I think you, most of you know this. Um, but, you know, IT are still, if you like, the gatekeepers who are charged with making sure that the business's data is secure, um, that it's well managed, that it's governed, um, and that it's kept safe. And it's all very well having some new fancy, you know, open source tool on a laptop which somebody can do some sort of analysis on or whatever. Um, but the IT department knows that, it, you know, their uh, jobs are on the line if, if this data is not kept secure, well managed and well governed. At the same time, of course, they're struggling with, you'll see the word legacy there, um, and we know that up to 80% of most IT directors' budget is spent on legacy technology. 
Um, they're struggling with some of those technologies that they put in a long time ago, but they've spent a lot of money on, and you know that aren't really delivering value and aren't giving them the performance and flexibility that the business is expecting. Staff, um, I put there because especially in the area of analytics, we know um, for a fact that thing, people like data scientists are in short supply and the kind of experts who can take a large data set, analyze it and give you the results uh, are, are definitely few and far between. So, you know, staff is, is obviously an issue for many companies. So more and more companies are looking at other alternatives as to how they can get better uh, flexibility and agility from their infrastructure um, without breaking the budget, which is the other word on that slide. Now, that picture on the bottom right, many of you, uh, if, if you do know your cars, you might recognize that as being a, uh, I think that's a uh, Mitsubishi Lassetti, which was the star in Top Gear's um, car in a reasonably priced car section. So um, that's why I put that on there, because the IT department often is expected, expected to do an awful lot, but the budget isn't there for them. So, uh, you know, the, the, IT, the enterprise wants the Bugatti Veyron, but they're giving them the budget of the uh, Mitsubishi Lassetti. And um, we won't say too much about uh, Mr. Clarkson's fracas, which seems to have taken up more news pages this month than the uh, actual general elections in the UK. But I think you get my point is that, you know, IT budgets are stretched and, uh, you know, they're obviously not delivering what they're expected to, but there's all these sorts of challenges. Now, let's move on. So, how, what, are, what are companies trying to do to solve this bottleneck? Well, a lot of companies have, um, have played around with Hadoop or implemented Hadoop and seen what they can do with that. Um, you know, will that solve the bottleneck? Does it mean free storage? We can just put in some commodity Intel servers, you know, and uh, put all our data in that. Well, no, it hasn't solved the problem. Um, neither has no SQL uh, databases like MariaDB and uh, Mongo and so on. Um, and the reason is they're designed for large data sets, but they're not designed necessarily for transactional resources. They're not designed to be in any sense real time. They work very much in batch mode. So they definitely have their uses, but they obviously haven't solved the bottleneck, which is about speed. Um, and my fourth point down there is, you know, IT is obviously still critical, but it needs to enable the business to help itself. Um, and the question is, how does the, the, the IT department start to get past that bottleneck um, and my final bullet point there, which I'm sure you've already read, because I know on these sorts of things people read the bullets long before the speaker tells them, but um, it's not just about the real-time access to information. It's also about the process in which you, as an enterprise, are delivering applications to the business. And what I mean by that is you know, how much work is involved for application developers when they want to build a new application, or when they went to uh, when they when they want to deliver a new data set to end users, um, you know how much work is involved for those application developers? How much work is involved for the likes of enterprise architects? How much time and management uh, does this you know need the CIO to deliver? Um, there's all those sorts of things as well that go on in the background, which you know seem like kind of they're just day-to-day, -day, we just need to do that kind of things, but actually can be improved. The, the, the development cycle can be reduced with some of these latest technologies that we're going to hear about from Grid Gain. And, you know, definitely there's, there's an opportunity to make it a lot easier for developers uh, to, to get their job done. And in so doing, the idea is that we reduce some of that bottleneck I talked about um, and, you know, the slide I put up with John Cleese thrashing his car in faulty towers, you know, I think says it all. So that's what we're trying to do. So I talked briefly about Hadoop, and just in case you're in any uh, kind of thinking that there's a bit of a halo around Hadoop at the moment and that everybody's using Hadoop now for their data storage, 
and that um, you know the likes of EMC and IBM and HP and so on storage businesses are going to go away. Um, we we interview, as I said at the beginning, 10,000 people a year about their adoption of technologies. The number of them that are using Hadoop is that tiny orange slice on the very right hand side of those bars. We're just coming up to produce our next version of this. So, you know, as I said on my previous slide, Hadoop ha hasn't solved the problem and it's not designed to solve this issue of speed and big data. It's really designed to uh, be a, a relatively cheap storage platform for data that you haven't quite decided what you're doing with it yet. But of course, costs come in later on when you when you start to work out what you do want to do with it and how you go analyze that data. And um, you know, it's been said before that Hadoop's a bit like buying a puppy. You know, it's relatively free when you buy it, but the costs over the life life cycle, um, you know, grow considerably. So, what are some of the challenges? I mean, I've already alluded to some of these, so I won't read them all out. But um, you know, you know, most enterprises are finding that they've got more users and connections. They've got even if they don't have you know, that many more customers than they used to have, they've got more people hitting their website and analyzing their firm. They've got more people interacting on social media. Um, transactions are going up. Um, of course, there are more and more businesses that are in the e-commerce space, like online gaming, social, and so on, e-commerce. Um, you know, we've talked about the Internet of Speed, um, and so there's all sorts of uh, pressure uh, on traditional IT infrastructure, which wasn't really designed for these kinds of users. Um, and I understand that, um, you know, when you talk about sort of scalability uh, problems and challenges, you know, there's a website in China called QZone, which I believe is the equivalent of Facebook. Um, you know, they hit their first 16 million customers in the first week. Um, it's just staggering when you think back, you know, 20 years ago it would be inconceivable. Uh, and so you've got companies like this that are having to deal with this and work out what kind of infrastructure they can use to handle this incredible uh, scale that, that so many companies are seeing. And even in more traditional businesses, we're trying to analyze data from more and more sensors in our factories, our shop floors, our web blogs, our websites, and so on. Um, so even if we don't have a huge uh, growth in customers, or even if we're seeing a decline in customers, we're trying to analyze a vastly more data than we used to um, because we can and we're able to get a bit more sophisticated about what we do with that data if, and this is a big if, if we can cost effectively analyze that data and get it to the right people at the right time rather than it just be you know, a bit of an academic exercise. So again, I've talked about some of these challenges, but if we get specifically to databases, which is the area where Gridgain obviously is, is going to talk to you about, um, there are some uh, you know, clear challenges with traditional databases. And I don't think it's any surprise that you'll see um, you know, some of the younger database companies raising large amounts of investment from VC capital because they know and the VCs know and their new young customers know that uh, you know, the likes of Oracle, IBM, uh, you know, HP, SAP, Microsoft, etc., with their databases, they're doing what they can to address these challenges, but equally they weren't designed with them in mind. And so depending on what you're trying to do, there are different approaches which may well work better for your organization. And that's why we're seeing quite a lot of investment in younger database companies. That's why we're seeing so much excitement around the likes of Hadoop and Mongo, MariaDB. Whether or not they solve all of the challenges, there's definitely you know, a problem for some of those incumbent vendors. Of course, they're working on it, and they're adding things like in-memory options and so on. Um, but they know, and the market knows, that there's a change happening. And the question is how your organization deals with that change. So these are some of the potential options that companies are trying to adopt in order to break through that bottleneck that I talked about. Um, if you remember my slide with the Bugatti Veyron um, and the star in a reasonably priced car from Top Gear, um, you'll remember that the organization wants more speed and flexibility, and that's not just in terms of 
delivery of information in real time, but also in terms of the development life cycle. And they also have budget constraints. So, you know, their relate, tr traditional relational databases aren't always working. So they're looking at a number of different options, and these are some of those that companies are thinking about that we talk to. So the relational database vendors like IBM and Oracle have had, added what they call in-memory options or add-ons. Uh, you know, IBM's called Blue Accelerator. Oracle's got a, um, you know, Oracle in-memory option. Um, but fundamentally, there's still a price to pay for those, um, and you're still dealing basically in the same environment that you were dealing in, potentially with a little bit of increase in speed, but uh, you've still got issues around uh, scalability, uh, especially when you start to think about wanting to store time series data. For example, a sensor that reads you know, time series data every second. Relational databases were designed really with transactional data, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand transactions an hour rather than hundreds of thousands of transactions an hour. So um, their in-memory options certainly seem to help with analytics, but po possibly not with transactional side. You've obviously then also got pure in-memory databases. You'll know many of them, the sort of uh, MemSQL, VaultDB, and so on. Um, and they're doing a great job depending on what you want to do again. Um, they also mean... Uh, to some extent that you have to pay for memory, which is expensive compared to disk. And although the price of memory is coming down, it's still not free. Um, and also, they're not ideal for very large volumes of data storage. So, um, you know, they can be good to work as sort of an in-between role, but you're adding a layer of complexity and you still probably need your relational database, etc. There are data streaming offerings um, from uh, lots of companies these days, IBM, Software AG, bought Apama from Progress and so on. Um, and they have their roles, especially in very things like uh, very high volume, very low latency transactions where you need very fast throughput. They've definitely got a role to play, but they're not really designed for storage. So you still need to consider what your database platform is going to be there. And you've got analytics in the cloud and database as a service. Again, for, for testing and dev projects, um, for certain types of use cases, absolutely fantastic. You can pay OPEX, you can try it out without a huge investment, all great. But if you want real-time, very fast data, you're reliant on the Internet. So that's not necessarily going to be ideal for everybody. And then there's the in-memory data grid uh, cache approach. Um, some of the advantages are you need less rewriting of applications and the database. Um, and, you know, massive performance improvements that we've heard about and I think you're going to hear about from GridGain. Um, and the only question there, I suppose, that 451 would, would, would post would be, you know, to some extent you're adding, you know, another layer uh, rather than completely swapping out the database. And that has its own pros and cons. You know, swapping out the database is a vastly complex and uh, expensive job. Um, so I think we're going to hear now from GridGain to see how they try and you know minimize that complexity and make things as easy as they possibly can in the grid and cache approach. This is my final slide. It's our view of the total data approach. Um, it's just to show you really all the different areas that my team covers. Um, I won't talk too much about it, but you can see the three Vs in the middle there in the economics. Around the outside, we surround it with a business case. So without further ado, if you'd like to consider continue the discussion with me, feel free to ping me an email or let me know what you thought or how, uh, or, or how informative or not informative my discussion was. And without further ado, I'm just about over time. Thanks very much. I'll hand it back to Gridgain. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jason. That was, that was excellent, and I thought it was very informative. <laughs> um, and so, as you said, now we're going to go ahead and hear from Nikita, who's going to take a deeper dive into how Gridgain is uh, solving these problems that you talked about. Um, Nikita, why don't you take it over? Dan, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Jason, for a great overview. So what I want to spend the next 20 minutes is to give you um, a fairly high-level overview of what Gridgain does and you know, what's our vision of fast data? What kind of, what we're building a software to support that vision. And 
I'm going to give you a, a bit of a rundown of what we do and how we do things. Just a quick um, notice, the grid gain essentially is the enterprise version of Apache Ignite. Apache Ignite is the free Apache Software Foundation project on top of which we built. We were original developers of this project. The project is pretty mature. It's been in development for almost 10 years by now. And grid gain develops the enterprise version of that. So what is Apache Ignite? By the way, I'm going to be using Apache Ignite and grid gain almost interchangeably. Apart from enterprise in a version and some of the services we bundle with the version, uh, with enterprise version, this is the same type of software. So what is the Apache Ignite? We call it in-memory data fabric. And the words in-memory and data fabric are pretty important here. For, first of all, it is a, a software solution uh, that runs on a cluster of computers. And architecturally, it slides in between your data sources and your applications. And it delivers all the benefits of the memory computing, predominantly extremely high performance and high scalability. Those are two metrics, performance, high performance, low latency, and scalability, that typically define our in-memory solutions. Before we dive into the details, let me just talk about a little bit about these two things. Uh, we routinely get asked, what's the difference between, you know, a disk-based processing, a flash-based processing, and a memory? What are the differences? And specifically, how the in-memory computing is different from just utilizing flash storage. And it's actually fairly not intuitive, because people sometimes confuse flash and memory, but it's really nothing, uh, not even close. Typically, uh, in-memory systems, uh, the systems where you use RAM, of computers across a cluster as your primary data store is anywhere between two to five orders of magnitude faster than the disk-based systems. We're talking about you know, a thousand times faster, thousand times faster than an equally um, than equal disk-based systems. And that's the major difference between a flash and a RAM. Flash can only give you a marginal improvement. So if you're looking for two, two times, three times faster reads on your data, my flash is probably a good option to speed up. Because remember, flash is still basically a disk. And that's how a system view the flash. It's still essentially a disk with just, just much faster seek time. When we talk about in-memory solutions, such as the in-memory data fabric that we developed, it has a completely different paradigm of how do you store data and how do you process data. Data is stored in exactly the same RAM where your processing is happening. And therefore, it's not a disk, it's actually byte addressable storage. It has completely different characteristics that lead to this massive performance increase. And the performance increase is truly massive. In the end of the presentation, I have a slide for you where I'm going to show you some of the um, metrics we achieved for our clients. But the, the difference between flash and RAM is this dramatic performance increase, multiple orders of magnitude. Back to the memory data fabric. So the key uh, architectural um, idea here, as depicted on this on this on this slide, is that we truly slide in between your data sources in apps, and then this sliding ability, basically not asking you to replace your database, as Jason mentioned, is the key for us. You know, your working organizations go ahead and think about what it would take to replace, let's say, Oracle or MS SQL or DB2 from IBM from your organization. It's, in many cases, literally impossible. It's even impossible to change those settings. That's why, basically, with a memory data fabric, if you have your existing database, keep it. Don't even touch it. You can layer this fabric on top, essentially deploy your software on a cluster of computers, you know, architecturally in between your databases, whatever they are, by the way, SQL, NoSQL, or even Hadoop, and your applications. And the fabric will take care of basically intelligently moving and storing data into the RAM across multiple computers away from databases and giving you abilities to process data right in this layer. Now, the reason we call it a fabric, and I'm going to switch to my next slide, is because there are, we support multiple types of payload or types of processing on that in-memory layer. We essentially look at the memory in more strategic view than a lot of different projects and vendors. For us, it's not just a data grid, a compute grid, or caching. Those are just the different use cases of what you can do 
if you take a strategic view on memory as your storage tier. When I present about the subject, I always keep telling my audiences that the traditional computing is what I call a disk first, memory second approach. You know, your data stored on disk, like we've been typically doing for the last 40 years and 50 years, uh, uh, if you include the tapes, we start on the use of this program to cache some of the most frequently accessed pieces, pieces of data. It's a very logical approach because if you're constantly going for one another for exactly the same piece of data on the disk, why not store it locally, right? And that's what means disk first, memory second. Disk is a primary storage. In the memory systems, such as the memory data fabric, where we take a strategic view on RAM, the RAM becomes the primary store of data. And we do use disk only for the backup purposes. So in this picture, it's a RAM first, disk second approach. Once again, we use RAM across multiple computers as a distributed fault tolerant in memory data store. And we use disks essentially as the backup devices, just to make sure we're backing up the data if you, if you decide so to do. So the name fabric, actually, it's kind of important for us because, as I mentioned to you, the unique, unique property of what we do is that we support multiple use cases, multiple types of payloads. Um, on the fabric itself. So we talk about, we'll talk about data grid, a compute grid, service grid, in memory streaming, um, even Hadoop acceleration that we have in the fabric, it's all part of the fabric. It's a very nice, elegant approach where you don't have to essentially gobble together, you know, apples, oranges, and cucumbers for multiple projects and try to integrate them. You get all of that in cohesively developed, same documentation, same learning curves, same configuration, same management tools for all those different types of um, types of use cases. Some of the key features of the fabric uh, that basically cross send um, it's kind of in a cross section across all of the different you know sub functions that we have is on this slide. Definitely performance. You know, we talked about it. It's pretty obvious. You know, we all intuitively understand when we talk about in RAM, in memory perf computing, performance seems to be an obvious thing. What a lot of people don't realize is what I mentioned, how dramatically bigger the performance is in a memory systems compared to other systems, like the disk-based systems. Scalability. That's actually less, much less intuitive. It must, many people don't realize, but let me give you a quick uh, historical walk back here. What's actually unique about a memory system is that from a day one when we started doing the memory computing, you know, as an industry, you know, back in early 90s. If you remember back in the early 90s, we only had 16-bit CPUs. Later on, we have a 32-bit CPUs. There was not enough RAM on a single computer to do anything useful. So from a day one when we start doing the memory computing systems, we had to do distribution. We had to be able to basically link together multiple and multiple computers to really get this kind of virtualized pool of RAM that was big enough to do anything useful. So what you'll find today is that in-memory computer systems are the most advanced distributed systems in existence. For a lot of folks, it's very counterintuitive. What does the in-memory have to do with distribution? It has to do a lot. Because from a day one, not because we were smart enough, but because we were forced technically to do the distribution for the last 25, 30 years. And that would basically make systems like grid gain is so advanced in, in, how the, in how the scalability is managed. Just to give you a quick example, our largest customer runs us on 2,000 nodes in a fully transactional topology. And I will challenge anybody to find too many projects or products that can sustain that type of a significant load under the fully asset transactional topology writing transactions in 2,000 nodes. That's the level of scalability you can get with systems like this. High availability. Kind of a sister property to scalability, but high availability as well. A lot of people basically saying, well, if it's in memory, what happens if I unplug my computer and the RAM is volatile? Well, technically, it is correct. But practically any systems, and grid gain is not an exception here, would have fairly deep and rich functionality, how to ensure that data is high available properties. So data can replicate across multiple nodes. Data can be stored on the disk locally if it needs to be. There's a multiple strategies how to deal with this. For example, Gradient even supports a geographical data center uh, replication if you need to have that functionality. So the high availability is there. What's really unique about what we do or very convenient for our use case, we support full transactionality. 
Unlike a lot of NoSQL databases that only support eventual consistency transactions, we support fully asset transactions. Exactly the same transactional behavior you'll find in traditional databases. So when you move some of your logic from, you know, from store procedures and PL SQL, things of that nature, into the data fabric, uh, you basically have the same data consistency guarantees in terms of transactions. And it's a very convenient because the biggest problem a lot of people have when they move from databases to different types of storages is the consistency models breaks. And you have to re-architect your system to support that. In our case, exactly the same transactions, both pessimistic and optimistic transactions, you can use that. Persistence. Sometimes people ask me, what the hell persistence has to do with memory computing? That's the whole point of a memory, not to have a disk persistence. And that's actually a fairly limited view. What's really interesting is that every in-memory computing system today would have a persistence story. Remember I told you about memory first, disk second. This is the right way to look at a memory computing. In memory computing is not about eliminating disks. It's basically using disk for different reasons, for backup reasons. And that's exactly what we do here in Data Fabric. Uh, you can naturally have a, you know, asynchronous or asynchronous or any type of optimized, optimized persistence of your data on the disk if you decide so. You can persist on the disk. You can persist in database. You can do all kinds of different things. And last but not least, security. Our enterprise version has a great built-in security with full audit trail authentication, authorization, and all these different things. So I want to basically give you a quick rundown on some of the key functional areas behind a memory data fabric. We'll talk about computing data grid, service grid, streaming, and Hadoop acceleration, one of the key areas. That's not all of them, but those are the key areas. So compute grid, what is the compute grid? Compute grid is all about parallelized processing. If I have 20 computers in my cluster and they have all this data in RAM, how can I run an effective computation on this data? We, it's actually a very interesting use case because we keep talking about the data storage in terms of Hadoop, but the biggest portion of Hadoop, for example, is MapReduce's the ability to process the data you store in Hadoop. So in the memory computing systems, the compute grids basically um, fill, the same, fill the same void. How do you process the data you already have? This processing can be, fairly, can be fairly sophisticated and complex in many cases. How do you parallelize this processing? How do you load balance? And how do you fail over? We support very advanced feature set when it comes to compute We support multiple versions of MapReduce, one for in-memory computing, one for Hadoop uh, compliance. We support very cool zero deployment technology that allows it to basically develop this very effectively without constantly deploying to a cluster. All your code changes get automatically deployed on the cluster as you run it. So you can have exactly the same development uh, workflow as if you would work locally on one computer. You have a task scheduling. We have a state checkpoints for the long running tasks. A very cool feature came to us from our multiple biotech clients. If you have long running tasks and Typically, you know, a bioscience has very long-running tasks. You can checkpoint them. And if a task fails, you want to restart that, it will restart from the last checkpoint, not from the beginning. If your task runs virus, it's a big deal of improvements. We have fairly advanced load balance and automatic failover. We have a full cluster management. It's a very important feature uh, because when you do the computational task, you always not always, but you know, you often uh, need to have a very specific access to your cluster. See which nodes you have available, which resources available on, on those particular nodes, and how to change in time. And you want to basically have your mapping logic or essentially balancing logic be very custom towards those res available resources. We have all this functionality available to you. You as a developer, as an engineer, can have very, you know, um, hands-on approach in how do your task actually execute in the cluster. So we're not hiding this functionality from you. It's exposed to you as a developer. Data grid. Data grid actually fairly similar to compute grid, but it's solving a different problem. As compute grid solves the parallelization of the computations, the data grids essentially allow you to solve the problem of parallelization of a data storage. So the problem is, again, very similar to compute grid. If I have a terabyte of data, and I have 10 computers in front of me, each have, you know, a 100 gigabyte of data, so the entire cluster has a terabyte. How do I store my terabyte of data on a terabyte cluster across 10 computers? So naturally, somehow, data has to be partitioned, 
if I partition data, how do I do the failover, how do I do the load balancing, how do I do high availability, all the myriads of these questions is handled by DataGrid. DataGrid essentially is one of the biggest part of a memory data fabric. Fundamentally, it, it is essentially a core layer on top of which almost everything else is built. It's how do you store data into this virtualized um, memory layer. So fundamentally, in-memory data grid is the object key value, distributed key value store. Uh, it's built on Java, so it's GVM-based. Any GVM languages like Java, Scala, Groovy would work perfectly fine. We also, by the way, have a non-GVM clients for .NET and C++ applications. But fundamentally, it's based on an object key value store. We have both replicated and partition ability to ways to store data in a replicated mode uh, each key value pair is stored on each node for extremely high availability, but it limits your size of the, uh, limits the capacity of your cluster. In a partition mode, uh, essentially each key value pair is stored only in one node plus multiple replicas for high availability if you need to. That gets to a much better capacity utilization. In a typical, that's the main mode of storing data um, in your in your in-memory cluster. Sometimes people call it a sharding, but it's a much more advanced technique than that. Typically, data grids store a tenth of terabytes. In-memory computing system in general, you know, performed the best with basically limits itself at around tens of terabytes. Um, we're not there yet to use the systems of petabytes of data. It's not there yet from an economical standpoint. But we've seen plenty of customers and users who basically use from, you know, you know, sub terabyte to lower teams of terabytes payloads. And that's a thing that's where um, there's a sweet spot. So being a GDM based software, Java based software, we support both on heap and off heap storage, very important. Uh, so that we, we utilize the entire um, hardware capacity that's available on a particular node, not only what's managed by Java, but everything beyond Java as well. As I mentioned to you, one of the biggest things we have in data grid is a full asset transaction. So the same transactions you you have in the database. It's a big, big deal. It's one of the most complex parts to implement, and we have that. We also have a full SQL support. So once you have this data in the data grid, you can access it by key value, or you can access it through standard SQL. You can literally just you know, issue the SQL query. If you don't know the keys up front, you want to run a SQL query to get those uh, to get this data out. You can run SQL. We support joints, distributed joints as well. So we support full SQL 92, and we have pretty cool functionality on top of SQL, like custom SQL functions you can develop in Java and different languages. Another interesting aspect of what we do, and that goes to the messages of Fabric, uh, is because um, we provide a high integration between the compute grid and data grid, and it's only possible when you have that integration. What it allows you to do is it allows you to do the collocation, very smart collocation, and we call it affinity collocation, meaning that there is affinity between the computation and the data this computation needs. It's a kind of very, it's kind of deep question, but it's an extremely important consideration in distributed systems, because in distributed systems you want to avoid any noise traffic, you want to avoid any data movement unless absolutely theoretically minimally needed. And ability to collocate, essentially send the computation to a node where the data exists for that particular computation is the key for the distributed system to perform well. And we have that in automatic mode. Um, and there's a great integration between the compute grid that actually manages these computations and the data grid that manages the data distribution. When they're fully integrated, you gain this collocation ability in a very simple way. It's a very important consideration. Memory service grid, yet another component in the fabric. And now you're basically starting to get a sense of what the fabric really is. It is a combination of these functional areas in one cohesive product, which is great. So service grid, you know, we've heard from our customers that they've been constantly asking us, well, actually for a couple of years by now, that, look, guys, we have this cluster of great gain of our Apache Ignite running, and we just need to have one or two services that would run robustly on this cluster. So if the node crashes, this service will automatically restart in some, in some other node, essentially following certain SLA. And that's exactly what we did. That's a simple functionality. But I'm surprised how oftenly widely it's used. And that's, that's a great stuff. So you're building your applications, your systems. You have many of these microservices that you want to run on the cluster. And typically, you want to run one or two instances of that. 
And without this functionality, you have to write quite a bit of a code to really support all this health monitoring, restarting, starting, and the whole SLA management. With a service grid, you have an absolutely brilliantly simple interface to it, an API to it, literally a few lines of code and configuration, as a matter of fact, not in the code at all. And you can run your service right on the grid, and we're going to take care of the entire SLA, how to maintain and monitor it and start and restart it in many cases. Great functionality, used quite a lot. Yet another functional area is the whole streaming and complex event processing, and it's also part of the fabric. It, again, it reinforces the idea behind a fabric of a combination of multiple types of payloads and use cases for it, which you can do in, in RAM. So streaming is a very exciting use case. We're starting to see more and more and more um, emphasis on this from Apache Ignite, even from a different projects in the in Apache ecosystem. And streaming is very different from a traditional database, right? In databases, you always have a finite set of data. If you look at your table, there's always a beginning, there's always an end, right? And you can create this table through SQL or any other means, but the data is finite. It can be large, but it's still there's a beginning and end. In streaming scenario, what's really unique about it, there's no beginning and there's no end. There's always a stream. The data is always coming in. Because of that, there are different types of processes or processing paradigms exist for streaming. The major one is, is a sliding window. You typically process streams on a sliding window. The sliding window can be defined by you either as a developer, but it's typically, you know, last n events, last five minutes, last hundreds of transactions and whatnot. And it comes as running queries or processing on that sliding window. And you'll be surprised at how our non-trivial this can be, because it's extremely hard to maintain the system operations when you have a never-ending stream. There's no way to buffer up, there's no way, for, there's no way to store it somewhere, because it's never-ending, it's literally endless. So the entire system has to be built with this high performance in mind. There should be not a single bottleneck, because this is a true system where it's going to be as slow as your slowest component. And with our emphasis on memory processing, with our emphasis on the memory data grid as a storage layer, extremely high performance storage layer, and our compute grid as our fully parallelized and computational engine, we added here a what we call the continuous querying capabilities on the sliding window. And that's really great because it's very simple, very intuitive API interface. If you have a sliding window, you can register a query with it, like a SQL query, for example. And you're going to be able to get updates from this query, not just the one result as you would do in traditional database applications, but you will get a continuous callback with the results from that continuous query. That gives you a very simple, uh, very effective paradigm how do you work with streaming data. Once you have these results, you can now store those events in a data grid or process them or do whatever you need. But um, great functionality, very simple to use. You can literally get up and running with streaming applications literally in a matter of in a few hours once you download the Apache Ignite. Great stuff. Obviously, it's all fully distributed, fully scalable. It has all the benefits that underline the entire data fabric. One of the last things I want to talk about is the memory Hadoop accelerator. I'm not going to spend too much time. I don't have too much time today. <coughs> but it's a great feature, again, of our fabric. And if you know anything about a Hadoop, Hadoop in general, there are two, two systems there. Um, they just have the storing method used for passing the data. And what we've done in Apache Ignite, we've developed the first in-memory file system that's fully compatible with HDFS and fully replaceable or can work on top of HDFS as the cache. And we also developed, and that's the really unique part, we developed a, a full re-implementation of MapReduce based on the memory principle that's fully compatible with original MapReduce uh, through Yarn infrastructure in Hadoop. So, bottom line, it's a complete plug and play. Nothing to change. You don't have to change code for any of your Hive, Peak, or MapReduce jobs. You don't have to migrate data anywhere. Keep it in Hadoop, keep your jobs running, just install Apache Ignite, configure your, um, configure your new map, produce literally one line change, and you get tremendous performance increases. Just to give you a quick overview, if you run a Pi calculation example that comes with Hadoop, just a basic example that comes with Hadoop, uh, if you just run without Hadoop and then, I'm sorry, with Ignite and then without Ignite, just a few configuration changes, you get about 30 times performance increase, three zero. 
basically order magnitude performance increase in performance with absolutely zero code change. The last slide I want to basically mention to you guys, um, since I'm out of time a little bit, I'm going to basically skip the slide and talk about this use case on this bear bank. Uh, that will give you a sense of what a memory computer can do. I'm not going to bore with details. We, we had this plan a couple of years ago, and we closed the deal. It's a very large bank in Europe, one of the largest banks in Europe, and they had a very traditional use case of portfolio risk analytics, basically calculating risk on each change in the market. Very traditional use case. Just to basically give you a sense of what we were able to accomplish. On a 10 commodity blades, 10 Dell R610 blades, literally commodity blades, uh, with total capacity about one terabyte of RAM across the cluster, we're going to be able to achieve a billion transactions per second. Now think about it for a second. It's a billion with a B, fully asset transactions per second in a financial application on a, a hardware installation that costs less than 25K, less than the cost of a new car in Seattle, in California. That's what's unique about in-memory computing in general. It's, that's, it's nothing, it's less about the grid gain, although grid gain definitely was the key software here, but this is what, this is, should give you an idea what is possible with the fast data software. That's what fast data is. You can get to the numbers like a billion transactions per second uh, on literally on a cheap hardware setup with the right type of software. So I think this is the, uh, Dan, I think this is my last slide. And um, we can definitely open up for Q&A, you know, whatever couple of minutes we have left. All right, fantastic. And thanks a lot for that, uh, Nikita. That was uh, excellent detail there. And um, we do have some questions here. Uh, we will only have time for a few here, um, so let me go ahead and, and uh, jump right in to the first one. Um, I think these questions are pretty much going to be for Nikita. I mean, I do have some uh, questions uh, that would be uh, um, excellent for Jason, but I'm, I, let's go ahead and uh, handle the kind of the more uh, technical ones first. So um, here's someone who says, um, what RDBMS are supported by this product? What about right through DB performance? Uh, any SQL based, any GDBC or ODBC database we support. We don't have any specifics. So typically it's your Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, MS SQL, DB2s. Uh, the right through performance we use there GDBC drivers. So we don't really affect that. We have an option to do this right through synchronously or asynchronously. So obviously in a, in, a, in a synchronous mode, you get all transactionality that's carried over across memory and database, but you lose some of the performance because of a synchronous execution. In asynchronous mode, it's called asynchronous right from behind. Um, you don't really have any impact on performance, but you get certain delay between data in RAM and in data in, in database. But fundamentally, we support any, any standard SQL database. Okay. Great. Um, all right, here's another one. Um, can organizations slash companies uh, use this in-memory fabric for data analytics? How is it different and better than something like Apache Spark? We get that question pretty routinely. So, Yeah, Spark is an awesome project. Uh, I think the difference here is pretty, uh, pretty evident. The Spark is great for what I call interactive data science, classic data science approach, where you have a human being sitting in front of the computer and he really, you know, types queries, sees results, you know, analyze them, think about them, and, you know, massage them. It's a typical data science in approach. Uh, Great Gain or Apache Ignite can definitely be used for analytics, but it's really geared towards, in you know, a machine-to-machine real-time analytics. So you can basically, if you want to connect machine or process to another process, Grid gain is definitely a much better system that was designed for it, while Apache Spark is great for this kind of interactive, human-driven analytics. Let alone, you know, grid gain supports transactions and computational stuff, things that, you know, the Spark, you know, it's not focused on Spark. They don't support that at all. Okay, super. Um, thanks for that. And um, also, here's another one. Uh, uh, someone asking about uh, SAP HANA. Um, is, is, so they say SAP HANA is having flash memory, which improves the performance of data processing. What uh, 
does Ignite do provide that uh, SAP HANA doesn't? Again, Ignite is about in-memory performance, not flash-based performance. And uh, we're going to outperform SAP HANA, you know, dramatically. But again, not because we're smarter than, you know, SAP people, uh, but because we do things differently. And SAP, you know, HANA is predominantly a, you know, kind of cross columnar role based database. Uh, and that's where they basically concentrate. It's essentially a SQL-based database. Um, the fabric is, is a different beast as you've seen. We have streaming support. We have a dedicated computation support. We have dedicated data grid support. Um, and SQL is just one of the options we have. So that would be the difference. And again, performance would be the key difference as well. Performance and scalability. Okay, great. Now, uh, you know, I think this question is probably uh, better for Jason. I definitely want to get Jason back in. Uh, so uh, here's a Another question. Um, so we're investigating Hadoop as an all. Actually, this is uh, they mentioned Jason. Uh, we're investigating Hadoop as an alternative to a, a data warehouse. But you said that it won't save the world. Why do you say that? And what are the implications for data management? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the reason I say that is that Hadoop really is set up and designed for relatively low cost, and I say relatively in inverted commas, because um, you know, we know that the skills required, uh, it might run on commodity hardware, but the skills required to start to analyze and get some value from that data aren't cheap. So I say relatively low cost. Hadoop's design is a relatively low cost storage platform, but it's not going to give you um, the very rapid real-time access to data that more and more companies are looking for unless you look to use something like a grid gain on top of it, which gives you some of that caching ability to, um, to really help you to scale up and give you the performance that you need. So, you know, we see Hadoop, it's, it's absolutely going to grow um, because in the Internet of Things um, that we're seeing, more and more companies want to store um, all sorts of data before they've really worked out what they want to do with it. Um, and Hadoop's great for that because you can, you know, put it in there. It's relatively cheap storage. Um, and then you can start to do some data wrangling on it and start to work out, you know, what, what is valuable and what isn't valuable. Um, but it's not replacing the traditional data warehouse like the Teradatas and the IBMs and the Oracles and the Microsofts. Um, because it doesn't offer that very rapid real-time analysis. It doesn't offer those joins between different types of data that you need um, in order to get, for example, a single view of the customer or a single view of, you know, your logistics chain or whatever it is. And and for that, that's the reason that those companies, you know, Teradata probably being the gorilla in the warehousing space, you know, they're not slowing down. They're still growing. Um, if Hadoop solves everybody's problems and it's pretty much free to download, um, those companies would be dying very rapidly, and they're not. So, you know, there's definitely a, a you know a, a difference in the terms of what you know what we what we're doing with data in those different platforms. Thanks, Dane. Yeah, thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you, Nikita, for all that excellent information. We're right up against the uh, end of our hour here. Um, just before uh, we close out, I did want to make everyone aware of the In-Memory Computing Summit uh, 2015 um, that's coming up on June 29th and 30th this year. This is the first ever conference uh, dedicated to in-memory computing. Gridgain is one of the sponsors, along with other companies like uh, MemSQL, uh, DataTorrent, SanDisk, and others. <clears throat> So uh, mark your calendar for that date. Uh, go check it out at www.incsummit.org, and uh, we'll hope to see you there. Um, otherwise, uh, everyone, thank you very much for joining the webinar today, and uh, have a great rest of the day.